um, working, you know, odd uh, uh, jobs, you know, as a telemarketer and vacuum salesman. Um, uh, yeah, and the lesson that I took away from being in the military is uh, is working as a cohesive unit. Re that it's a very much a communal thing, which takes the pressure off of you as an actor, I think, because you realize that it's not all about you and your role. That you have a role, uh, and you're to do the best job that you can at your role. You're supported by everyone else around you in effort to tell a story that's bigger than any one person. Uh, so as, as long as you do your part, it, it, it makes it takes kind of the ego out of it because you can't act in a vacuum. You know, obviously you. Um, someone has to film it or see it or light it and um, it's, it's, not, it's not something you can self-generate it, it needs uh, uh, a community to kind of create it and that, that it's the same thing with the military you have a gun squad and everyone has a role and someone's leading it and you have to know your role well and if the person in charge knows what they're doing what you're doing feels like active and relevant and necessary, and if they don't know what they're doing, then it feels like a waste of time and resources and dangerous. And, um, but really, I, I keep repeating myself at this point, but it's just this, this sense of community, that it's not, um, it's a team effort. Before and after of you being on the military, you applied to Julia, and it was different experiences before and after. What happened and how was that process of applying? You wanted to be there because it was more like an experienced school instead of being too much theoretical, maybe. What, what did you, why did you want to be in Juilliard and what changed after, before and after what being in the military that made you being accepted? I, I couldn't say what changed that, because yeah, I auditioned twice the first time I didn't get in. Um, I think probably maybe the thing that changed, you'd have to ask the people who, who let me in, I guess. But, but, uh, was that maybe uh, before I just wanted to be liked, and I feel like the second time I auditioned, I felt like I had an opinion about what I was saying, whereas before all my opinion was just to get accepted. You know, it, uh, but then you, I had a little bit of life experience uh, before auditioning the second time, and I, I, uh, I feel like that that maybe that's what carried into the second audition. You said you always try to be over prepared for auditions. Why is that, and when did you start thinking about that, of changing the dynamics of power in an audition? Oh, in an audition? Yeah. Um, oh, well, because the dynamics are set up for you to fail. There, it's, it's not a natural part of the process. Like, a, a auditioning, in a way, has nothing to do with your actual job. There, they, you know, you, when you actually do your job, you kind of get the luxury of finding it a little bit, but an audition is kind of like an end result, you, you know? They, they want you, they, not, not a lot of people have the patience for, oh, it's not there today, but they'll get it eventually. They, they, they want to see the character right away, you know. And, and that, that dynamic, it doesn't make sense. So, uh, and also the, uh, but it's kind of necessary, you know. Uh, uh, so I, I didn't, I changed my mentality when I auditioned, uh, as opposed to looking at it as being judged by people, I looked at it as an opportunity for myself to act. So like I, I could do how work on it. I only had like two days to get it ready, but and so that was unfortunate. But obviously, like you do the best you can in the two days that you have, and then um, uh, I would look at it as my, you know, this is my interpretation of it. You you also I also tried to hate everybody in the room. Like I feel, I feel, I feel like if you go in hating everybody, then there's there's no balance of wanting to be liked because you could take it or leave it. And if you didn't get the job, you're like, oh, see, I told you, you know. But <laughs> I didn't like those people anyway. On the other hand, you always try never to impose your rhythm or your pace in a set. Well, that's different. Well, auditioning is different than. Uh, actually doing it. Uh, doing it, you know, it's a collaborative thing. It's not about me and my journey, it's about telling the overall story, what the director is trying to tell. My job is to support him. Acting is a service industry, in my opinion. It's not, let me show up and impose my idea on everyone else. And obviously we're different people, so you may have a different idea about how it should go, and I may have a different idea of how it should go, then we'll figure it out together. It's not to, uh, you know, this is my movie, it's my, you know, like, I'm going to tell you how I think, because I just learned that that closes you off to maybe a better idea. You, I, I feel like you have to do a lot of work before you start shooting. I, I tried to do just to 
make myself calm, so I'm not nervous that I, I skip steps or I, I, I'm phoning it in or something. But then you have to be prepared to let it all go the minute you start shooting if there's in sacrifice of a better idea. And that, that makes sense to me, and I've seen that in practice with a lot of people that I've worked with, both these great directors, you know, who you would imagine, you would just come on set and it would be a dictatorship where they're like, I, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, I just, just do what I say, but they're, they're, they always come from a place of, you know, they, they know the subject really well, they know the story really well, but they're very, they're open to being wrong in sacrifice of something better, you know. Uh, so I try to keep that in mind. Going back to those years in school, what do you remember the most? What was something that you, that you could have learned that maybe in the moment didn't make so much sense, maybe you didn't value, but coming up the years, after the years, you said, that was something very valuable, very important for me as a student in Juilliard. And living in New York City, city which is also a very strong influence. That's, that's kind of hard to say, because I didn't know anything really about acting before I went to Juilliard. Like, I, I kind of knew plays, and I knew uh, things that I liked, but I didn't know, I had no technique, I guess, of how to have a long career. All, all I knew was, you know, like, I, feel like you're emotionally full at a young age, but you have no, uh, you know, with the play, for example, you're doing it eight shows a week. I had no technique of how to make sure that I was self-maintaining, you know, like a, I wasn't just, you know, you know, losing your voice, you're staying healthy, or you're making sense of what it is you're saying, and, you know. Um, I feel like the lessons I learned from Juilliard are kind of eke out through my life, where it's, I'm trying to give a good example of something, but, Nothing's, nothing's coming to me. Yeah. I'll keep thinking about it as we Then, after you go to school, what gives you the experience of being in Broadway and doing theater before going into the films? Is there something you remember particular of being in Angels in America, being in Broadway? Um, well, I guess the benefit of doing the play, there's lots of things that you can apply to being a film, even though they're completely different. But uh, I always felt that you do a show eight times a week, and often on Broadway or off Broadway, which was Angels in America, it's you know for three or four months. And always at the end of that, even though you've been doing it eight shows a week for three or four months, always at the end, I wish I could go back to the beginning because now I finally have a better sense of the character or, or um, a more economical way of telling the story. And, and I can just see how you can feel it, how the story, the play shifts from when you start for, uh, three months earlier to where you end, you know, three months later. And I, I know that uh, applies to film, that where um, you may get the benefit of doing a lot of takes, and that's, you know, say you do 20 takes, that's 20 different ways, that's 20 different ways you can tell the same story, and there's no right answer, which is both comforting and kind of terrifying, that you never, in acting, come to a right answer. You, you never quite figure it out. But I know that there's different ways to tell the same story, and I, you know, because of time or money on a film set, you only get so many opportunities to try to do that. Tell me a little bit about you being a cinephile. Was this developed during being in New York City? But also I've been reading that your grandfather had this like binder with a lot of films in VHS. Was this a combination? Because you've been talking about, I wanted to be an actor, to be working with the directors I admire. And you have a very impressive list, list with, from Jarmusch to Scorsese to Spike Lee and Terry Gilliam and all that. How did you develop that cinephile side of you between the teen years and the junior years? Do you remember yeah. of watching all those VHAs? Yeah, there were, my grandfather, yeah, as you said, had a binder of movies that he would tape off TV so my sister and I, my sister and I could watch them and they were, like, they had cut all the language out because they were on TV. So I would watch them, so I was new, I, and plus my, my parents really, uh, my dad in particular was really, uh, followed movies, so I knew adults were paying attention to these, you know, to films. And, my grandfather in particular, for like Audie Murphy movies, to Jaws, to um, uh, Lethal Weapon, like all, all, all these great movies that were very diverse. So then when I got in my teenage years, there was, you know, Blockbuster, I mean, there's, they don't have this anymore, but you know, Blockbuster video and Hollywood video stores, basically. And we would just camp out of video stores and give ourselves our own film education. And then it was just kind of through that that I 
found, you know, Spike Lee or, you know, uh, Terry Gilliam, all these great directors who, whose movie I liked that I never imagined that, you know, mm -hmm. 10 years from then I'd actually be working with them. Let's jump into some of your films. How was the experience of working with the Coen brothers and being in Inside Louis Davis? And I believe you are kind of a little bit of musical. Well, that's being generous. I, I, I think I can like uh, carry a tune and I know what so, some notes are. But uh, apart from that, uh, anyway, the I, 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 Coen <laughs> brothers, are, you know, that was an amazing experience for me. I was there for like maybe a week and. You know, you get to not only did I get to wear a hat in that Coen Brothers movie, a cowboy hat, but like uh, you, you got to work with them, and you saw like you know great filmmakers. They're very specific you know, about what they wrote. It's it's you know it's we it's not we're it's we are. It, you know, it's like down to the which makes sense to me because I came from a theater background where you're usually doing Shaw and Shakespeare. So you can't improvise that. You have to kind of stick to the script, but you can, how you interpret the language is up to you. And they're just, they're, they're amazing. They're, I mean, it's been often said, but it's so true that they're two heads of the same coin. And like, uh, you could really ask one a question and the other one would come up with the same answer. Um, I was, I was just really lucky and uh, petrified to be there. And then going into Patterson and Jarmusch and playing this character that is many things, is a bus driver, is a poet, but it's not defined by those things. It's more, so much more. How did you develop that character? How did Jim, how, what did Jim Jarmusch told you he wanted to do with this portrait? Well, kind of what you're talking about, kind of, kind of um, uh, almost how creating something can be mundane. You know, it's, it's not often in this, uh, huge explosion of inspiration and sometimes it comes from uh, Patterson has structured his life uh, so his physical life will be on autopilot he doesn't have to think about the clothes he wears because he pretty much wears the same thing every day and in his job he has a uniform he has a bus route it's pretty much the same places every day meeting the same people he goes yeah, he has a routine. It's very, so, he, it, but it allows him to float in life. It, so he can do his job, but he's he's carved out time so he can drift mentally and, and write. You know, he goes to the same bar. He has one drink. He walks his dog. You know, it, it's it's all very, and that that makes sense to me. Where you obviously as a life uh, as an actor, you crave kind of structure a little bit. So you can create what you want to. And his wife is almost the opposite. She can create anywhere. You know, he's outside kind of uh, drifting around the world creating and she's kind of locked in the house coming up with all these um, all these ideas. And I thought that I, that was just really beautiful to me. Then going into silence and Martin Scorsese, do you still believe that was the hardest job you've ever done? Because I, I heard you say something like, it's amazingly uh, hard to be hungry, to be really hungry and trying to act, because you had to lo lose a lot of weight, and it was a physical demanding job as well as dramatic role. How was that as an experience for you? Yeah, it was hard. I mean, it was great because I got to work with Scorsese, who I think is the tip of the spear as far as directors are concerned. He's, you know, uh, um, he's a master. Uh, it, yeah, losing weight sucks. It, like, it, it, uh, <laughs> just become obsessed with counting calories and uh, uh, because the look of what we were going for, the story of it was that when he leaves in the story and is gone for a month, you, you we really like this idea, or, or Scorsese talked about this idea of like, you really want to ask the question of like, because uh, we have no lines to say it, how can we visually show, ask the question of what, uh, what's been going on, you know, for the past month. What's, what, what have they been doing to him? And they wanted to make it uh, immediately clear. So it was really hard. But then the good thing about it is you're so tired that you you don't put anything on top of it. You're not, you're not trying to come up with ideas. You just have enough energy to say the lines and listen, and that's about it. How were the conversations with Martin Scorsese about a film that is so personal and important for him that took him a lot of uh, time to to release, to produce? Yeah, I can't remember exactly how many years it was, but something of over 20 years. Same thing with Terry and John Quixote. It's like 28 years. Um, 
kind of to what I was saying before, you would think that there, there has definitely been shots in that movie that he's been thinking about in his mind for 20 years, but on the whole, he, um, he would think that everything would be mapped out and storyboarded, but he comes, or just not in that literally storyboarded, but in his mind, but he literally comes to a set that has no idea how he's, he's going to do it, and listens to the actors, and listens to the, the set, and he had this great idea listening to the, the uh, insects that were there, like, oh God, this, I think I know how I'm gonna start the movie, you know. Um, he, he just, he takes it all in, it doesn't come in with a, you know, pre-planned idea that he imposes on everybody. So that was an, an amazing lesson, especially if you've been kind of gestating over an idea for, for that amount of time. You know, you, you never figure it out, which you, you never know anything, you never know anything. Before going into Black Lensman and Don Quixote, um, I would like to know, how did you assimilate to be part of a global worldwide phenomenon? Halloween just passed and your character, Kylo Ren, may be one of the most popular costumes for kids in Halloween and suddenly you could be opening the, the front door of your house and finding a mini Kylo Ren in front of you. How do you take in that? I don't know, I don't know. It's very surreal, I mean, imagine if that happened to you. It's, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's the same for me. I have no idea how to process that. It's fun. I mean, especially fun for the kids in my building. It only gets awkward when like, my dog walker shows up with a Kylo Ren t-shirt, and it's kind of strange, you know, the, here's, here's my dog, take him. Um, but apart from that, the kids I like, you know, the, um, it's surreal. It's, it's surreal. I have no, I have no way to you mentioned in an interview with that working with the Steven Soderbergh changing from another to another film that it was an, a blast because it was really economical working with him. Yeah. What did you refer to? What were you talking about? Soderbergh doesn't approach a scene of how many shots uh, uh, he, um, he doesn't think of it as like I need to get a lot of shots to make sure I'm covered. He thinks how how many how many little shots can I get? Not not tiny shots, but how many. What is the least amount of setups I can do to tell the story? <laughs> and I, 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 lo I love that idea because I, I feel like there's such, a, I mean, sim similar to Patterson, there's such beauty in economy, you know, where there's no wasted energy, there's nothing you're putting on top of the character. You're saying it is a fact, and that's it. There's, it's not my job to have an emotion about it. It's the audience's job. So, and it, it's hard not to get selfish as an actor to feel like I've been thinking about this for a year, you know, I've been getting physically ready, I've lost a lot of weight, or you put on a lot of weight, or you memorized, or you learned how to drive a bus, like for Patterson, it's, it's hard not to um, try to make the most of the moment and, you know, go as deep as possible. But sometimes you're so busy having your feeling that no one else is feeling anything, you know. Uh, so Soderbergh is, is does, he works in a way similar to Spike, actually. They work very fast and are, are very much about empowering you to follow your impulses, which for me, because I, maybe because I come from theater, like uh, my friend Noah Bombach will do 40 takes of something, and I love that because you can do 40 different versions of the, of the same thing, but uh, it forces you to get out of your head and not overthink, and I think that's true sometimes. The, I feel like the best version of a of a movie, so the best characterization that you have of your character is the first time everyone sits down at a table and reads it because there's no no one's trying to do anything. They're just they're just barely catching up to the language, and it's right at the front of everyone's feet. And, uh, uh, and the words are the you know the tip of your tongue. That that's to me can be sometimes the most exciting. And then it gets lost in overthinking the shit out of it or um, overanalyzing things, and you're in your head and it's not organic. You know. So I see. The, the, Either way, there's no version that's right. It, uh, there's, they're just both interesting ways of working. Talking about the man who killed Don Quixote, uh, how did you get involved? When did you first hear about this story? How did Terry Gilliam approach you? And what were you talking about the character? I, I mean, I first heard about this movie when I was uh, in high school, because I knew that it was, you know, yeah, I discovered his movies and wanted to know what the next thing he was doing. And, and then, you know, Fast forward to how many 15 years later that you're actually doing it is was you know it was a no-brainer that he reached out about this movie and uh, obviously the answer is yes anything that he's doing and then the character uh, he, 
don't know if you've read the book, but it's the spirit of the movie is very you you expect like Cervantes and to, it, it, it to be some you know dense work of of fiction that's you know kind of a slog to get through and, and it, there is beautiful writing in it, uh, but it's also filled with like you know slipping on a banana peel you know like fart jokes it, it's it's both high brow and, and, and low brow. Um, I don't know where I was going with that. But, uh, he, he liked this idea of someone who was disillusioned by their profession, who, who would become uh, autopilot uh, in, a, in a different way, where he, he knew what was successful but wasn't surrounded himself with people that were challenging him at all, or was challenged himself and became disillusioned by his job because it became so easy. Um, and to, to meet someone who's pure inspiration who, who breathes it, to be confronted with that, and then the process it takes of killing your old self and you know coming back to who what originally inspired you to be you know to do your job in the first place, I thought again was a great idea. Shall we take some more questions from the press? I believe there is a mic. I have a question in regards to uh, you know being a father. Did it change anything at all? You know your input into films. And I'm gonna leave that one. Come on. <laughs> okay. Does being a father change my impulse into films? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, it, it changes everything. In what way? I, I don't. I don't want to get into it. I don't want to get into how. It's kind of private for me. Uh, <coughs> and about fame then and popularity. Sure. Uh, what, what, what it means, fame for you, and did it change at all using the Star Wars movie at all? Um, I, don't, I don't know if I'll ever understand or like, be comfortable with fame because it's, as you can imagine, an unnatural way of being in the world. I mean, just imagine living your life for 30, 40 years one way, and then suddenly you're the world, you know, people's relationship to you changes. That's that's a strange, uh, it's a strange way to exist. And some people are more comfortable with it, and some others, it's not. It's not what comes natural to me. It's also um, uh, kind of antithetical to my job. My my job is to live life and uh, make mistakes and not worry about. Um, uh, being analyzed so much because you're trying to have experience and take, uh, you know, internalize that experience and maybe use it later or maybe not. It's just that that's just how I am used to being in the world. But then suddenly, when you go to a place and you're the person that people are looking at, uh, I, as you can maybe imagine, that would probably make you self-conscious. You know, it, it, you can't help but be aware of, that, you know, and. Some people are natural about it, and they they can you know exist in the world, and it's and it's no problem. And uh, and you know I have my moments where it's fine, and then others it just seems completely um, counterintuitive to being a person. Uh, so so I, I don't have an answer for you, but that that's how I deal with it. I guess is uh, is is not really dealing with it and uh, trying to ignore it as much as possible, and and um, and you know live life. Next question. Thank you. Uh, yesterday afternoon, Mr. Gilliam told us about his uh, approach to directing actors. And he also spoke about trying to find a specific side of uh, how you act, how he directs every specific director. He quoted uh, Mr. Pitt in 12 Monkeys and finding this uh, Funny, funny gestures he made. So I'd like to ask you what uh, Mr. Gilliam's directing brought about you, taught you in the creation of the character in Kishiyotu. I, I tend to overanalyze and overthink. And t you can't, you can't do that so much in Terry's movies. You, uh, not that you're not thinking about what the story is and that there's no conversation happening. It's just like throwing things at a wall. It's not that. It's you know filled with conversations about how, uh, you know, what the story is. But you can't, uh, uh, 
you can't overanalyze, similar to Spike in a way, I guess. In Terry's movie, often we're fighting the sun, we're fighting the budget, we're fighting sand and rocks, you know, we're in like some precarious, you know, volcanic mountainside and we don't have a lot of time. And, uh, you're wearing crushed velvet pants hanging upside down, you know, uh, a green screen giant. You don't really have time to think, you just kind of have to respond. And, um, that was beneficial for me in particular because I'm, I'm very much in my brain. A lot. Uh, this season you hosted the uh, premiere episode of Saturday Night Live, which I think is a bit more, I think it was a little bit out of character, maybe for some of the work that you've done recently. You've certainly done comedy and anything with Terry that is going to be irreverent and silly, but Saturday Night Live is sort of on a different level. You really have to let go. I know it's live and that's not uncomfortable for you, but was there anything about that experience that was unique to you and different than what you've done either on the stage in more scripted sort of, you know, months to prepare theater or the more dramatic work that you've done for cinema? Well, it's my second time having done it, so it wasn't the, uh, totally foreign to me. Uh, um, yeah, Saturday Night Live is like that kind of a rare institution where it, it is very, it's a cross between theater and, um, in that it's, you know, and uh, TV, and that it's live TV. So obviously the pressure is on to kind of go with it and not overthink. But yeah, it, it's rare. So I'm, I'm always grateful when I'm asked to do it. Thank you very much. And thank you, Adam, for being here. Okay. It's been a great pleasure talking to you.